let me introduce um, our speaker tonight. Uh, Scott Schweigert is curator of art at the Reading Public Museum. He's been with them since 2009. He's more, uh, he has more than 20 years of curatorial experience. Uh, before coming to Reading, he was director of the Suzanne Arnold Art Gallery at Lebanon Valley College in Anvil, Pennsylvania. He has curated over 50 exhibitions, including ones on American Impressionism, James McNeil Whistler, Louis Comfort Tiffany, uh, William Trost Richards, German Expressionism, Spanish colonial paintings, Latin American art and installation art. Mr. Schweigert has taught art and architectural history at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville, the Pennsylvania State University, uh, Shippensburg University, Albright College, and Lebanon Valley College. He heard, earned his undergraduate degree at Dickinson College and his master's degree in art history at the George Washington University. Um, Scott has also held fellowships at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, he's a specialist in European art of the 17th century. Uh, welcome, Scott. Thank you, Grace, very much for that introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, it sounds like the Gatson's doing really great things, probably with the help of you all, which is really wonderful news. Um, uh, donors are so important to the lifeblood of a museum. That holds true no matter whether you're in Pennsylvania or in Florida. Um, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity tonight to speak to you about this great exhibition that is up on your walls at the moment, uh, which is um, uh, Women Artists for Centuries of Creativity. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we'll do a walk through history and a little bit about uh, uh, the history of women artists uh, and the importance of women artists. Um, Angie and I had an opportunity to speak a little bit earlier today about uh, museums looking at themselves and sort of thinking what portion of our collection has uh, women uh, represented in it. And so the answer to that question is usually a very tiny percentage, uh, unfortunately. Uh, that has been changing uh, over the last 20 plus years. Um, and so we hope that uh, that continues to change and that balance um, begins to uh, begins to reappear. So I'm going to share my screen, and uh, we're going to um, have a look at some great slides. Again, the show is called Women Artists: Four Centuries of Creativity, and it really the nugget of the show or the core of the show really began with an, an, an in-house exhibition that we mounted uh, about 10 years ago in what was then a new works on paper gallery uh, here at the museum. It had just debuted um, about a year earlier. And so I believe this was about the third show that we, uh, that we hung in that uh, gallery. Uh, we have about 12,000 works on paper here at the Reading Public Museum. And prior to that new uh, works on paper gallery in 2008 we had no place to show uh, no dedicated gallery to show uh, photography etchings engravings and lithographs um, so this sort of opened up a whole new opportunity for the museum um, and that show uh, again sort of uh, was one of the earliest in that uh, in that uh, exhibition space um, I, i'm showing you linda nochlin who in 1971 asked the question, why have there been no great women artists in a very famous and sort of landmark um, uh, article that was published in Art News and in other locations. And the story goes that she talked to uh, the sister of uh, Richard Feigen, who was a well-known New York City art dealer. Um, and he said to her just sort of casually, you know, I'd collect women artists, but there aren't any great women artists. And so this uh, was something that um, left Linda Nochlin, who is a, an art historian um, uh, who went to Vassar and who taught at Vassar uh, and who got her PhD at uh, the uh, Institute of Fine Arts in New York City. Um, this, this made her um, uh, want to know uh, about women artists. And um, this was uh, sort of on the coattails of the feminist movement of the 1960s. Um, and all of this sort of bubbled up at the same time in the early 1970s. So the question posed was, why are there no great women artists? Why don't we know 
artists of the caliber of Michelangelo, Titian, Velasquez, Manet, Monet, uh, the list goes on and on. Um, and so the first phase of feminist uh, art history was sort of uh, figuring out who these women artists were. Uh, because they had mostly been unknown, lost in the shuffle of history. Um, and uh, it really took um, a, about another decade or so until a sort of radical group called the Guerrilla Girls started challenging museums and, and, and making them um, sort of take a look at themselves and identify what portion of their collections were women. And so you see the very famous, do women uh, have to be naked to get into the Met Museum? So the, the subtitle there is less than 5% of the artists in the modern art section of the, the Met are women, but 85% of the nudes are female. Uh, so there's this disparity that um, that the Guerrilla Girls, who was this sort of anonymous activist group, sort of performance art, but they they pushed the issue and pushed the agenda that male dominated art world, both uh, both uh, uh, the museum world and uh, the commercial art world, um, had to had to recognize. Uh, the disparity between the representation of men and women. And you see um, uh, below uh, the very famous, did they have to get naked? Um, how many women had one person shows um, at New York City's uh, galleries? And so you see in 1985, um, there was one woman. In 2015, um, that's you know uh, 30 years later, uh, there's only been uh, a, a, a few added to that. So things are getting better, but they're not great. And so shows like this, I think, are, uh, are important. Um, my background is mostly Italian uh, European art um, um, and especially painting. So an artist like Sofonisba Anguissola, who was born in Cremona, um, and became uh, well known. There's this story that she went to Rome and met Michelangelo um, and eventually ended up being the court painter to Philip II of Spain, uh, where she painted these remarkable self portraits and portraits of her and her family. Um, she was one of the first women that we know of um, who's, uh, who sort of blazed a trail um, as an independent artist. Um, in a world that uh, did not make it easy for women artists. They usually were not accepted into the academy, sometimes not accepted into artist guilds. Um, and so the road was tough um, unless that woman either had a husband or a father who was also an artist. And so that's how so many of these late Renaissance and early uh, Baroque artists became um, uh, skilled as painters, this very famous um, uh, work called The Chess Game, which is a portrait of the artist's sisters playing chess right from the middle of the 16th century, shows you the extraordinary skill that she had at capturing uh, not just um, uh, the, the, the images of these sitters, but also sort of the emotional content um, of family and, um, and, and enjoying uh, oneself. Um, so she, she definitely was uh, one of the trailblazers. Another trailblazer, of course, was Lavinia Fontana from Bologna, um, who is considered by many to be the first professional artist uh, who made a living as an artist. She was trained by her father, Prospero, who was an artist, and she had a husband who was also an artist. But guess what? She's the one who got the commissions and uh, she was the most popular uh, court painter among the nobles of the city of Bologna and her husband cared for their 11 children. So there's this great role reversal uh, in the 17th century that Lavinia Fontana um, uh, sort of uh, flipped, flipped the tables on everybody. Uh, here are some of her portraits, portrait of a man leafing through a book um, uh, in Bordeaux and a wonderful uh, painting at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, which I know you're partnering with for some of these programs uh, with that wonderful lap dog from right around the turn of the 17th century. Um, Artemisia Gentileschi is probably the best known woman artist 
uh, of, uh, of the Baroque period, uh, sort of the early modern period. And uh, she was painting um, at the time that uh, sort of in the wake of Caravaggio and this um, revolution in naturalism and realism that was happening um, in Italy, uh, both in Rome and in Naples and other cities. Um, and her father, Orazio Gentileschi, uh, trained her. Uh, she was famously raped by uh, one of uh, Orazio's students. And um, her biography is com as compelling as her paintings are including Judith slaying Harold Furness uh, in the Galleria Palatina in Florence, um, a wonderful Judith slaying Harold Furness, a bloody and gory image uh, from the Capo di Monte, um, and a beautiful painting from Detroit, uh, which actually happens to be in a, an ex exhibition dedicated to women currently at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Connecticut and Hartford uh, that will tr also travel to Detroit um, later this year. Uh, Artemisia also received um, a monographic exhibition at the National Gallery last year. Um, and um, she, she and Sofonisba Anguissola were the subject of the first ever exhibition at the Prado in Madrid, Spain. Uh, dedicated to women artists. So, you know, the Prado has been around since the uh, 16th century, and this was the first exhibition ever dedicated to women artists. So it's, it's an extraordinary landmark for them. The show that uh, is up on your walls in Florida starts with Elisabetta Serrani, at least chronologically, and she, like Lavinia Fontana, was an artist uh, who had been trained by her father. Uh, the self-portrait in the middle uh, is from the University of Pomona in California, but the image uh, that is on your walls is an etching of the Holy Family with St. Elizabeth and John the Baptist from right around the middle of the 17th century. Um, she was was um, extraordinarily skilled. Um, she was in demand um, in Bologna, and um, her, her reputation, um, some art historians would argue, is as strong as her father's was. Um, a wonderful Dutch artist named Judith Lester, uh, her self-portrait is at the National Gallery, and a great painting of hers is at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. It's on the right of your screen, private collection of the um, a Mary Trio on your left. Um, she was painting around the time that Rembrandt was uh, painting in, uh, in Holland, and she captured um, sort of that, um, that naturalism that was in vogue um, through throughout Europe, not just in Italy, but also in Spain um, and in the Low Countries as well. Um, so artists whose names we know. Um, when we get to the 18th century, uh, Elizabeth um, uh, Vigée Lebrun uh, is a name that is uh, associated with um, the, the French royals and uh, her very famous uh, self-portrait at the Met um, and another one at the, uh, the National Gallery um, shows her and uh, in her guise um, as the painter holding a palette uh, in front of a canvas, sort of advertising her skills. She famously painted, of course, Marie Antoinette and her children um, in another grand painting that is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. You notice a lot of these early women are uh, sort of limited their uh, subject matter to uh, themes of family, motherhood, still lives. They did not, for the most part, paint um, mythologies, uh, biblical stories, um, and the great histories of Greek uh, and Roman history, although some of them did. Um, uh, and so there's this, this, this sort of pigeonholing of the artist uh, into what was socially acceptable for them to paint, the subject matter uh, that they were familiar with, the domestic sphere uh, was uh, what most of them um, uh, focused on. The work that's uh, included in the show is Innocence Taking Refuge from the Arms of Justice right from the end of the 18th century. Um, she, of course, is a, a famous painting of the Rococo style and one of the most fem important female paintings in all of the 18th century, um, serving as court painter to Marie Antoinette. Um, and this engraving by Bartolozzi uh, was executed and published in London in 1783. And it was created after a color pastel 
uh, drawn just after the French Revolution when she adopted um, this, this sort of new style of neoclassicism. Um, and you're looking at um, an oil on canvas of the same subject by Vijay Lebrun on the left. By the time we get to the 19th century, um, um, artists, women artists, um, some of them are allowed to go to the academy and study, um, um, not uh, uh, officially, but um, uh, private schools. Uh, Rosa Bonhoeur, um, uh, uh, whose work is included in this show, uh, 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 titled "O Daughter of Arabia," uh, which is probably from the 18th century, uh, probably from the 1880s. Sorry, um, and she was famous as an animal painter. Um, she was mentored for her by, by her father. A very similar story uh, to the Renaissance uh, women artists, um, and her father was a landscape artist, and so he sort of passed that on uh, to her, but her love of animals uh, was obvious from an early age, um, and um, this this portrait of her is is rather extraordinary. Uh, she's considered to be an early feminist, and she supported herself financially, managed her own estate, cared for her menagerie of animals, dressed like a man uh, in some uh, in some cases, smoked cigars. Um, and while this was rather shocking to Parisian society, um, uh, they, they were sort of forced by her um, skill to reevaluate what a woman artist was. Um, Violet Oakley is important as a, a painter in the Philadelphia area and in um, Harrisburg, uh, the capital of Pennsylvania, where her extraordinary murals are on view uh, that date from the 19 teens. Um, the work that's in um, uh, the exhibit is the uh, for the Pre preservation of Italy, guardian of the world's most precious heritage of beauty. Uh, and that dates from right around the end of World War I um, and is a lithographic poster uh, with an allegorical figure. She was an illustrator and muralist uh, who worked in Philadelphia. Um, and uh, with the completion of her murals at the Pennsylvania State Capitol, she was the first American woman to receive a public mural commission and the second woman ever to be hired as a faculty member at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts. So by this time, by the, by the 19-teens, uh, women uh, were beginning to get um, some cred, uh, credibility for um, uh, for their academic training and their um, uh, and obviously for their skills as uh, both painters, illustrators, and in Violet Oakley's case, um, a muralist as well. Sonia Sonia Delaney's um, a circular competition uh, composition from around 1970. Um, uh, she was born in the Ukraine but spent most of her career um, in Paris with her husband Robert Delaney who was also a famous uh, uh, painter. She, they founded um, Orphism, which was an offshoot of Cubism um, that was um, developed in the 19 teens. Um, and she's also um, known for her groundbreaking, sort of breaking down the barriers between fine art and uh, applied art. She was a textile designer, a stage designer, um, and a printmaker as well, which all gained her worldwide attention. You see her dressed up in this fantastic uh, uh, costume uh, on the right. Uh, Kitta Kollwitz is one of Germany's most well-known uh, artists, um, and she was a German printmaker and sculptor sort of between World War I and World War II. Um, her life was uh, filled with um, uh, subjects of mourning, um, loss, and poverty. She often interacted with her um, uh, husband, who was a doctor, uh, his medical patients. Um, uh, women and children became her favorite subjects. Um, and um, she was one of the first um, uh, faculty members at the Prussian Academy of Art. So she rose uh, through the ranks into uh, a position of, um, of authority and uh, training in that Prussian Academy. Louise Nevelson is an extraordinary artist 
um, who was also born in Ukraine, uh, like uh, Delaunay. Uh, she moved to the United States when she was a young woman um, and studied at the Art Student League uh, with Hans Hoffman and trained with Diego Rivera, the Mexican muralist as well. She's most well known for her uh, large scale um, um, wooden sculpture um, and uh, Skygate number one, uh, which is a cast paper relief multiple um, is included in the show um, uh, from 1982. Isabel Bishop is an interesting artist too. She was a New Yorker. Um, she was one of the Ninth Street uh, artists. She observed uh, the world around her, a uh, girl in slacks or ink and wash drawing from 1960s um, is a subject matter that she, uh, she returned to again and again. She was a great observer of the city and city dwellers. Um, and so uh, fashion and, uh, uh, and styles changed throughout the course of her career. Uh, uh, the Vero Beach uh, probably has her, her masterpiece, uh, which is Hearn's Department Store, 14 Street Shoppers from 1927. She was um, sort of a WPA era uh, artist. Francois Gillot uh, uh, is an extraordinary artist in her own right, but uh, is often connected uh, with, um, uh, with Pablo Picasso. Uh, she was born in Paris and encouraged uh, by her parents to become an artist. Uh, at the age of 21, she met Picasso, who was 61, uh, and the two began a 10-year relationship. Eventually, Gillot um, uh, left Picasso. Um, angry with the breakup, Picasso used his influence to pressure dealers into refusing her work, uh, but she sort of, um, uh, she managed uh, to sustain her career um, uh, despite his, um, his sort of bitterness uh, at the end of their relationship. Um, and actually, one of the great deposits of her work is not too far from Reading. Uh, it's at Ursinus College in Collegeville in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, and they have the, uh, the, the, the most uh, of her works um, anywhere in the world. Um, by the mid-century, women um, had uh, sort of joined the boys' club um, uh, that was dominated by Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko, but Joan Mitchell um, was an artist who sort of blazed her own trail. This is her Meditations in an Emergency from 1954. She was an abstract expressionist working in New York City when the avant-garde was on the rise. She was born in Chicago, uh, but she found inspiration in the world around her and sort of contempt, attempted, like most of the abstract expressionists, to convey her feelings and emotions throughout her canvases and her prints. Um, Lee Bontecu um, uh, is included in the show with a lithograph from 1977. Um, she was both a sculptor and a printmaker, as you can see from the, the work at the Museum of Fine Arts in Texas on the right. Um, uh, her work is sort of reminiscent of science fiction and fantasy genres. Um, she, um, uh, in an interview in 2009, um, Dory Ashton wrote of her that she was difficult to categorize both when she first emerged as a woman artist and in a still largely male dominated New York art scene. She was neither a minimalist or an abstract expressionist, although her works share similarities from both movements. So she's this sort of interesting hybrid artist um, who, um, uh, again, sort of was skilled in multimedia, um, not just printmaking, um, not just um, sculpting, but sort of the merging of those, uh, those two media. Um, women artists have been a hot topic in the art world and in museums uh, for about the past 20 plus years, but the momentum has really grown. Um, uh, some headlines here, Baltimore Museum of Art will only acquire works by women artists, um, a show at the Denver Art Museum um, in 2016 of women abstract expressionists, a tale of two women painters, Sofonisba Anguissola and uh, Lavinia Fontana. That's the show that I mentioned at the Prado. And the most recent show is called By Her Hand, Artemisia Gentileschi and Women Artist in Italy, 1500 to 1800, which is currently in Hartford um, uh, until January 9th of 2022. Um, 
we don't just have the works that are on your walls by women, uh, but we've got lots. And actually, we've been collecting women artists since we began collecting art in uh, 1913. So it's been 100 plus years. The work in the upper left of this slide is by Mary Lies, and it entered the collection in 1913. Actually, all of the slides, all of the images on this screen were, um, were acquired by the Reading Public Museum before 1918. Uh, to give you a, a sense of where we were um, with women artists uh, at the turn of, um, uh, of the last century. Um, these are works that entered the collection before the 1930s by women uh, artists uh, here at the Reading Public Museum. Um, it's, um, and these works on this slide have all entered the collection in the last three years. Um, uh, by women, uh, including Cecilia Bow, who was the first faculty member, uh, first woman faculty member at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. Um, another slide of works on paper by women. Um, Mary Cassatt uh, is, is among our collection, Barbara Morgan, Bernice Abbott, uh, another Sonia Delaunay, another Louise Nevelson, um, and sculpture as well, um, going back to the 19 teens by Malvina Hoffman and um, Anna Hunt Hyatt Huntington um, and, uh, and others uh, have entered the collection uh, throughout the course of the last 100 years um, here at the, uh, the Reading Public Museum. Uh, these are all women artists represented in our galleries. Um, the museum here is a, a broad uh, collection from everything from uh, late Renaissance and Baroque uh, through 19th century academic art. Uh, everyone always sort of wants to know about the Reading Public Museum. Uh, we have European arms and armor and world arms and armor. Um, uh, we've got uh, ancient art from uh, Egypt and uh, Greek and Roman collections. Um, American art is our strength. Um, here at the museum, uh, constituting the bulk of the permanent art collection. Um, uh, Harry Bertoya and Keith Herring uh, were both uh, born here, or both both worked here uh, in Reading. Keith Herring was born in the hospital right across the street uh, from the museum uh, here in Reading. Uh, we have world uh, collections too. Um, uh, this is a, a view of our World Cultures Gallery, which featured um, uh, Chinese, Thai, and uh, Japanese these arts, uh, Native American uh, art as well, represented in the collection, um, pre-Columbian Latin American, um, and yes, uh, natural history. We also have a planetarium and a 25-acre arboretum here at the museum. Um, but that's that's all I have. Uh, I'm happy to take questions uh, if you all have them. Um, in the meantime, it's been a great pleasure. Uh, to uh, to be able to present to this group. Um, thank you for your uh, dedication to the Gadsden um, and to the good work that you're doing in Florida. That was fascinating. Thank you so much, mm -hmm. Scott. I, I really appreciated it. And, um, you know, we, you highlighted some of the pieces in the collection that we have on display right now. And there's so many others that I know we didn't have time to go over today, but are just really important artists from across several centuries. So I don't know if anybody had any questions they can, um, oh, I, Lindsley, I think had a question. Let me see. Hi. Yeah, um, I, I clicked the little raise my hand button if you guys wanna know how I did that. Um, Scott, just curious for those of us who enjoy um, watching movies in particular, um, you know, reading, reading books or just kind of learning more, are there any fun, um, resources, um, movies, you know, videos. I feel like that um, Picasso story is so ripe for, um, you know, turning into film. But, um, you know, if we were intrigued by some of what you talked about, are there places you would point us to learn more? Yeah, Mary Gerard has written a lot on Artemisia Gentileschi. And uh, there also was a, an exhibition catalog that was published in conjunction with the uh, National Gallery in London exhibit that was last year and uh, that is a great resource um, uh, for Artemisia Gentileschi. Um, women artists, the, the bibliography is growing. Um, I just purchased a, a book on Sofonisba Anguissola by Michael Cole. 
Um, and uh, that is a great resource. I think uh, the Wadsworth Athenaeum in, um, in Connecticut is publishing um, a, a catalog with, uh, in conjunction with By Her Hand. Um, and so those are great if you're looking for historical um, uh, figures. I think Joan Mitchell, there was a, a biography uh, that was published not that long ago um, ab about that abstract expressionist artist. So if you're, you're looking for something more contemporary, um, th that, that's a great one. Um, the, off the top of my head, those, those are the ones that spring to mind. I mean, there are a couple on my bookshelf behind me. Um, the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art also did um, uh, an exhibition dedicated to Artemisia and Orazio Gentileschi about 10 years ago. And that catalog was written by uh, Keith Christensen, who is their, um, their um, uh, European curator. Uh, so th those are great places to start, especially, again, my, my focus is, is, is it's Italian 17th century. So th those, those are the, the books that I'm most familiar with. But yeah, uh, Lind read Linda Nochlin's article as well. Why have there been no great, I mean, that is a great place to start um, because it's sort of the, it sort of triggered all of this scholarship in the wake of that. Like it was a wake up call for everybody. So I think that's a great place to start. Terrific, I, thank you. I will send a link to you all. I've got that somewhere, I will find it. Um, and uh, Lindsley, there's a great book called, um, called The Ninth Street Women. It's it's about this thick, so it's, it's no joke, but it talks about Joan Mitchell and Helen Frankenthaler and some of the other artists who are working during that time in the 40s and 50s and um, in, in New York. And it's really quite, kind of quite interesting, so. Um, yeah, is, Isabel Bishop, I think, is in that book, that book yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, Pam's got a question that asks, as with other artist endeavors, have we uncovered where women are actually the artists, where men took credit? Is there history to rewrite? You know, it's interesting because the the slide that I showed of Linda Nochlin with why have there been no great women artists, that cover, that portrait from the Metropolitan Museum of Art had been attributed to uh, Jacques-Louis David, um, but it, it, it got subsequently attributed to a, a woman artist uh, incorrectly, but then it, it the the final attribution ended up being a woman artist as well. So there was this instance of um, uh, the the attribution had been given to a man, of course, um, and so that was just sort of the default. Uh, it had to be a man, um, and eventually um, the truth came out. And so I don't know whether um, uh, a man took credit for a woman's work or whether. Uh, it, it, it just laid unidentified as, you know, a 17th century studio work or something like that. Um, I don't know of any. You certainly instance, talked but... about a lot of father daughter. Situation. Yeah, yeah. There, there, and there... That, that reeks of it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. There have been. That's a very good point. There have been some instances where the father had been given credit, but eventually the attribution shifted to the daughter. Mm -hmm. So absolutely mm -hmm. right about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I will say in a lot of my research, it was really interesting because there was, you know, women like Sarani and um, Bonnar and Vijay Lebron who were, it, you know, taught by their fathers because their fathers believe that women should be able to learn and be, you know, learn about art. But then there are those instances like Picasso where the women or the men were actually in hindrance. So um, it's really quite interesting. There's an, another question from okay. Judy and Scott Gregory. Have you heard of Helena Eastman Ogden Campbell, a woman artist who graduated from Wesleyan College in Macon, Georgia? I don't know that artist's name, but um, that doesn't surprise me that uh, that that uh, um, that that I didn't that I don't know about her. There are so many out there to be rediscovered, um, mm -hmm. and so um, I, I I think she's probably on somebody's list. She'll probably be the subject of a, a master's <laughs> thesis or a PhD uh, dissertation eventually. Um, I think that um, you know art history departments and museum studies. Um, and museums themselves are sort of mining their own collections and rediscovering important women who've been lost through history. And I, I hope that trend continues. Thank you. Uh, she graduated in the class of 1897 and she was a painter 
and a collector. She studied art extensively throughout her life at Wesleyan in New York and in Paris. And then she got a collection that we showed actually at the, the center. Great. Yes, and arts. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it looks like Linda Vaughn said um, Women Artists in Paris was a wonderful exhibit at the Clark Museum in Massachusetts. So yeah, that's another great show. Um, there, there, there are projects, I think, everywhere at major institutions. Again, the Artemisia show in London, I think, was the first solo show dedicated to a woman in um, in their entire history. Um, and uh, they've been around for a very long time. So um, you know, when you see an institution like that um, start start to pay attention to women artists, it, 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 you know, here it is, you know, like, you know, 50 years later after Linda Nochlin, but at the same time, uh, it, 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 it shows that progress is being made and um, institutions are looking at their own collections and sort of reevaluating, you know, do they need another work by a man or is it more important to um, like the Baltimore Art Museum to dedicate acquisition funds to, to, to women? It looks like Laura Harris um, posted uh, in response to Lindsley, Francois Guillaume's book, Life with Picasso was a great read. So I'm going to be putting that on my list. Thank you. <laughs> it's not a movie, but it certainly could be. Great. Uh, could she's be still movie. she's still living, actually. She, yeah. uh, Francois Gillo is still is still she's around. like 99 or something yeah, crazy. Yeah. Extraordinary, just That's extraordinary. Just yeah, mm -hmm. I saw a show of hers at the Berman Museum this summer. Um, uh, prints and portraits, um, and you know she's just an amazing artist. Mm -hmm. wow. Thank all right. Th thank you all very much for your questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Scott.